About a month and a half ago, I made a trip to City Hardwoods in Birmingham, Alabama with Sean Stone to pick up some rough sawn cherry lumber for an upcoming collaborative project. And the project was going to be a makeup vanity for his wife. Now fast forward about a month after that and roughly halfway through the project, we, uh, we realized a, a critical dimension error that was baked into the design. And I'm laughing about it now because it's, you know, it's kind of embarrassing and frustrating to get this far into a project before realizing a critical error like this. But, you know, guess what? Crap happens. You just, you just move on. So long story short, we tried everything to modify the design, but unfortunately it was a matter of proportions. No matter what we did to the design, it, it, just, it just seemed like the proportions were off. So rather than scrap the material that we already cut up, we decided to divide the already completed work into two new projects. A dartboard cabinet and probably a children's desk or maybe with just a little bit more design work, a media console of some kind. But basically, that means that all of the video footage we shot for the vanity build is now going to be repurposed for those two projects. So just keep in mind that the video is covering the first half of the build, or video, I don't know how, how much editing I'm going to do to this. Uh, they will be referencing the original vanity design, and about halfway through the build, we'll switch over to the final design. This is the largest piece of lumber we got in our batch. It's uh, eight quarters in thickness, which means it's two inches in thickness, and it is 15 and a half inches wide and about uh, eight and a half feet in length. This is plenty enough material for all of the leg pieces for the lower cabinets, as well as the corner pieces for the upper cabinets. Luckily, all of those pieces are the exact same shape, so it's gonna be really easy to lay out all the pieces and get them out of this. Uh, but we need to pay attention to the wood grain. We need rift sawn material for all of these and not plain sawn or quarter sawn. So I've got an example piece. I'll bring the camera in closer and show you exactly what I'm talking about. This is a piece of pine. It's southern yellow pine to be exact. And it's a good representation of what we're looking for anytime we have like a table leg or something that is going to be on the corner of a project where you can see it from both the side and you can see it from the front. So... And this half of this board has the grain at about a 45 degree angle on the end grain, somewhat like a 45 degree angle, not, not exact. And what that gives you is when you, when you view the corner, you see nice straight grain on this face and also nice straight grain on this face. This is what you're looking for anytime you have like a table leg, like I said, or something where you see it from both directions. So if you have something without that 45 degree angle. In this case, this is more of a vertical angle. So when you view it from the front side here, you do have nice straight grain, but because the grain does not come out both faces, it only comes out this face, not this face, this face is not that nice straight grain. This is kind of what you would consider like the cathedral look. You'll have a lot of arches. If this was a wider board, you would see the arches of the wood grain. And individually, that may look fine, but when that is one face and straight grain is on the other face, it's just distracting. This doesn't flow visually from one corner or from one face around the corner to the other face. So we want to avoid that. I've taken a marker here and outlined all of the grain so you can get a good idea of how this board is actually looking on the end grain. And I've also taken a little piece of scrap cardboard and cut out a square. The inside area here represents pretty much the final dimension we're trying to shoot for with the legs. So I can put it around here and really get a good idea of how the grain is going to look. Remember if I go from the inside here, uh, the left and right faces will have some nice straight grain where the grain is coming through. But again, the top and bottom faces will have those cathedrals. We want to avoid that at all costs. So. Primarily, all of, our all of our leg pieces are going to be on the outside of the wood. And we can really take this and skew it just slightly to see how much we can exaggerate uh, the exact grain orientation that we want. So this, instead of cutting a, a square right out of the piece on this corner, if we cut a little bit larger and then mill it so the grain is a little bit more towards the corners, then we should be able to get something really nice out of here. So there's no defects this entire length on the right-hand side, so we can go ahead and say that this is going to be 
uh, four, actually, four of the corner pieces all the way through its length. And we need a total of 16. So the next one, we can try to get a little bit more on that angle. And as so long as we bandsaw these out, that should be fine. We still have a nice 45 degree angle. This should be, this should be pretty good for the second one. So using a little guide like this really does a good job of really determining exactly where you're going to get your pieces and allowing you to lay it out so you do have the best grain. Now, I don't have to perfectly outline my reference lines here. I'm just using this to uh, determine what part of the board that I need. But I did make sure to leave enough on each side to allow for milling and uh, the blade width and all that good stuff. So this will leave us quite a bit on the inside that will be flat sawn or quarter sawn, depending on which direction we look at it, uh, for other parts down the road. Now we didn't account for this material uh, for any other specific pieces, so we're going to have a lot of extra that we can pull from for anything that comes up. My first step normally is to cross cut when I'm, when I'm breaking down uh, rough sawn lumber, but in this case, if, if we just cut this in half and then quarter it off once more over here and once more over there, then what happens to all this center section that's not going to be the legs? Yeah, we want to try to keep the center section intact as much as possible so we can use it later on. Absolutely. So instead of cross cutting first, what we're going to do is rip off about four and a half inches from each side and that will leave us the center section fully intact along its entire length, which will give us more options later as far as uh, how far or how long the pieces need to be um, that we pull from it. So instead of getting too complicated with some material support systems on the bandsaw and trying to wrestle this through the table saw, the easiest thing to do is just break out the old trusty circular saw. As you can see from this face over here, uh, the circular saw had left a lot of burn marks. That's okay, number one, because we're going to further refine the boards and all that will be removed. Um, and number two, that's just the only tool we had to complete the task safely. The best tool for ripping down rough sawn lumber is the bandsaw. But like I said, this is just way too large to be manhandling across my bandsaw setup. So the circular saw was the next best bet. With the center section removed, all of that plain sawn lumber removed, we're left with two nice quarter sawn chunks of wood. We just need to cut this into quarters in half once and then in half again so we can start the milling process. Although we did refine the board slightly with a circular saw, I always say that the milling process starts, for me anyway, with a cross cut and I always use my miter saw. You can also use a circular saw or a jigsaw, but for me it's just convenient to use the miter saw to break down the lumber into shorter, much more manageable pieces to go to the jointer. If I was to try and joint this entire board at one time at the jointer, then I'm going to have to remove quite a bit of material to get a flat plane across its entire length due to any cup, bow, or twist that the board may have. But if I was to cut it into smaller sections and then take it to the jointer, I'm going to remove a lot less material in order to get that board flat. The thing with using a miter saw to do cross cutting on rough sawn material is if it's rough sawn then none of your faces are going to be absolutely perfect, including the most important face at the miter saw which is the face that references off of the fence. So in this case if I put the board to make the first cut over here, I've got a little bit of bow in it and it's touching uh, the fence back here, therefore not touching the fence of the saw. If I was to make the cut like this, then this board is probably going to bind and kick into or slam into the fence as I make the cut. So you always want to be mindful of the fence of your saw and make your cuts so that uh, in an order in which all of the pieces are nice and flush with the fence of the saw. It's also worth noting that uh, I positioned my miter saw in relation to my station so that the miter saw fence is forward. So in this case, where there is a little bit of bow and it is very, very close to touching back here, that's okay because it is still firmly touching the fence all the way up here where it really counts. The angled cut we just made at the bandsaw, that, that angled face is now the first face 
of what will be the rest of the, the square for the leg. So we can also turn the bandsaw table back to 90 degrees and then cut another rough face to make a rough 90 degree corner and then uh, mill that corner nice and square at the jointer. But for me, it's, it's just as easy to complete the rest of the squaring process, two faces, right here at the jointer. So we've got all of our fresh cut faces uh, from the bandsaw. We need to get that face flat first. I've got two different boards here on the jointer to talk about two different situations you might encounter as you're running boards through the jointer. This board has a convex bottom surface, meaning that its contact points are somewhere in the middle and not on the ends. So if I push down on this end, it's going to raise that end of the board. So in this case, if I was to continually put downward pressure on the infeed side and start my cut with pressure on the infeed, push it through the, the cutting edge and keep pressing on the, the uh, back side over here, once again on the infeed, then as I do that, it's still going to lift up as it reach as it goes through on the outfeed side of the jointer. I don't want that. Instead, I want to make sure that as the material is being cut, the downward pressure stays on the outfeed side of the jointer only. Once I have outfeed downward pressure established, I don't ever want to go back to the infeed side to put downward pressure. Now, in this case, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to ever put pressure down on the front. So even when I start, I'm going to start wherever it's most solid. I'm going to put downward pressure right here and continuously pass this through. And it's going to maybe nibble just a little bit at the front and then take a deeper cut back here. And I'll establish the downward pressure on the outfeed side no further than this point on this board. That will just basically let the front do whatever it wants to do without me ever having the notion of pushing down and changing my reference plane. This is already an established plane, so I'll maintain this pressure all the way through. Now, again, once I have this nice and flat to where uh, it is contacting through its entire length, but maybe I need to take one more pass, at that point, if it is indeed contacting throughout its entire length, then I can start with my pressure up here. I've switched the boards around and this board is the exact opposite situation as the first board. This piece has a concave bottom face so that the contact points are mostly on the front and the back. So in this case, I can have downward pressure on the front as I'm feeding things through. Now, until it is all the way supported on the outfeed side, I don't want to put downward pressure directly onto the cutter head. Even then, I still want to avoid having my hands over the cutter head. So I'll have downward pressure allowing it to establish on the outfeed. And once it is established on the outfeed, I can transition some force to the outfeed side pushing down and feed it through as I normally would. The last thing I want to mention before using the jointer, and this applies to basically any cutting edge that removes thickness. So uh, chisels, planer, jointer, hand planes, you always want to cut in the downhill direction. And I've got this board here to represent what that means. It, you can see that this, the grain here is not perfectly horizontal. It has a angled direction to it. Now, not in the orientation where it is, the board is level, what you want to do is twist it. And I'm looking at a monitor here to cheat. You want to twist it so that the grain is somewhat level. That determines your uphill and downhill direction. So for this board, with the grain being horizontal, I want to plane and joint and do all the cutting action in this direction, the downhill direction. Because if I don't, and I go in the uphill direction, what am I doing? If I hold the board level again, I'm trying to pull up that grain and that's where you get tear out and that's where you get a lot of problems. So always just take a second to briefly look at the direction of the grain and establish the downhill direction. So you want the cutting edge to be cutting in to the downhill direction. Now, even though this jointer is a helical head jointer, which will reduce the amount of tear out you get on figured woods or woods where the grain is changing in various different directions. I do want to make sure that I have all of the grain being jointed in the downhill direction like I just said. So anytime you are using or, or, or batching out a bunch of pieces through a machine, it doesn't matter what machine it is, take the time to orient all the boards so that they are going to be fed in 
uh, the proper direction without you even having to think about it. So in this case, I went through all of my pieces and I determined what the downhill direction was. So all I have to do without having to think about too much while the machine is running is grab each piece and cut it as normal. Everything should be in the appropriate direction uh, set up and ready to go before I even turn the machine on. Right off the jointer, we can take our pieces and run them through the planer with the jointed side face down. And this will make sure all of our pieces are a consistent thickness. And then also, mo most importantly, it'll transfer that flat face from the jointer to the opposite face. So we'll have a nice parallel board. Now, it's important to make sure that you are also planing in the downhill direction, just like we were jointing in the downhill direction. The main reason why we went from the jointer to flatten one face to the planer to get an opposite face nice and parallel and flat back to the jointer is that gives us more reference faces up against the fence, more options uh, so that we can verify that we are cutting in the downhill direction. If instead we just stayed at the jointer and took that freshly jointed face and put it up against the fence, and let's just say that our board made us cut in the uphill direction, well the only option we have for an adjustment is to flip it end for end while maintaining that same face up against the fence. And when you flip a board end for end, it doesn't change your cutting direction. The only time you change your cutting direction when it comes to opposite faces is if you twist the board. So, if we have two faces off of the planer, one that was jointed flat, the planer has the other one nice and flat and parallel, that gives us two reference faces that we can put up against the fence and therefore gives us two different options as far as the cutting direction. So, if we were previously forced to cut uphill, now we can cut downhill. When it comes to jointing the adjacent face 90 degrees, all of the same rules apply as far as downward pressure and making sure everything runs smoothly on the outfeed side of the table. But we also need to make sure that we take that nice flat face and maintain consistent pressure up against the fence. Everything's the same, except we have to make sure that the fence remains in contact with the wood at all times. The material we selected for the legs turned out to be fantastic. It is really, really straight grain stuff. There's no defects. Uh, the little bit of sapwood that is in a couple of these, I forget which one, I think it's this one, is not gonna be a problem one bit. We still have two legs on the bottom insides that we can hide some of the defects. So we're in a really good position with these legs. Now, we milled everything to be about 1 16th of an inch thick in both directions for these. And, and the reason for that is so we can, we're gonna let them set overnight, sticker stack them, and then come back and mill the rest of it out later. Yeah, so these will actually sit for a couple days probably due to our schedule. Uh, but those couple days that they're going to sit, uh, you know, we just introduced brand new wood to the shop atmosphere here. So it may have released some type of internal stresses or they may further acclimate to the shop. So when we have an opportunity to work with them next to uh, do the joinery on them, at that point, we'll do a final milling to get them down to their exact thickness. And any type of bow, cup, or twist that was introduced while they were sitting, we still have a little bit of thickness left over uh, to remove all of those defects. While the leg pieces rest, we start milling the rails and styles. Luckily, we were able to find a wide board that had very few defects. But unfortunately, with a wider board, you generally have inconsistent grain appearance along its width. So on the plus side, we will have great color consistency throughout this board, but on the downside, we will have to be a little bit more selective with where each part is cut out. To maximize the yield, I took my original SketchUp model and laid out as many pieces that would fit on a rectangle sized to the usable dimensions of the board. This gives me rough cut locations to start the milling process, and of course, the milling process is exactly the same as what I've already shown. This diagram shows all of the next pieces we need laid out on that single board, and we just made the initial cross cutting to bring this larger board down to much more manageable sized pieces. So for example, this is the 14 inch wide section, so right here, or 14 inches long. Now we have to lay out for the pieces that are on the inside of this. And in this case, on this 14 inch long piece, all we have are the two short pieces 
Uh, these are actually the rails for both of the upper doors. So we want the rails to remain consistent with the styles for the doors. And if I know that according to the board we just cut up, if we stay to one side of the board, then we'll have some really nice straight grain. And if I match all these pieces, like this note says here, both doors cut from the same side. So after I made all my initial rough cuts, I noticed on this board that it leans heavy on one side as far as straight grain. So we've got some cathedral going on here with some of this flat sawn area. And then this is rift sawn, so we've got some nice straight lines. So if we kind of make a center line down the cathedral, and if that's a center line, then somewhere right around here should be this, you know, all this in between my fingers should be symmetrical. Whatever we cut here should match well with what we cut here. That means all this stuff over here is extra. That's convenient because I'm going to put all the doors in this area on all of my pieces. The doors are going to look great. Nice straight grain. Uh, it, it's just going to look beautiful. So for the rest of this stuff, we need to make one initial rip cut at the bandsaw to separate these two boards. And that rip cut will be uh, less than eight inches on this side, which is the capacity of my jointer. So that's convenient. And on this side, it's only going to be enough for those particular parts, in this case, the doors. So if we go with, um, let's see, we need inch and a half and inch and a half pieces. That's three inches. Let's just go ahead and go with three and a half. That gives us a little bit of extra leeway to mill this edge as well as the blade curve. So let's mark a line at three and a half and cut all of our pieces from this board so that we remove just the straight grain side and leave another board that is less than eight inches with the cathedrals. It's a full 24 hours after we initially milled the leg pieces and we checked all of the, the leg blanks and nothing moved. Uh, there was no changes that we could measure from our first milling process. So we went ahead and milled all of the leg pieces to their final dimension and then cross cut all the pieces at the miter saw to their final length. Once we've determined the best from the worst, we took the time to put them together as they will be in the final project and at that point, really twist them around, mix them and match them, and find out which ones are perfect for each situation. So uh, in my orientation, I'm looking at the front of the vanity, and I've got my, my right, my left, and we have each one of these bundled together. So this is the, lo uh, the lowers are facing me in front. This is the lower left cabinet, the lower right cabinet, the upper left cabinet, the upper right cabinet. And we can really get a good visualization all the way around of what will and will not be seen. So once we've determined the exact orientation for everything, we need to mark the tops of these so we don't screw this up going forward. We need to make sure that these remain in the same orientation when we do the joinery and of course, obviously the assembly. To reduce the confusion, I labeled each cabinet. So the upper left cabinet is labeled A, upper right is B, lower left C, lower right D. And that's all of the components in here, A, B, C, and D. So a couple things we need to mark on each board is the letter to designate where it goes. So all of these are D. And then just a simple carpenter's triangle to represent where they are in the orientation. This wide face is the front, and of course, if we put these together, we can determine which one are the backs. So I'm gonna do that exact same process for both A, B, and C. Well, all the rest of them. We're about to lay out all of the mortises on the legs and corner posts for the upper cabinets. And at this point, things can start to get a little bit confusing. So I went ahead and on the inside faces where all the joints are gonna be, made a very rough line, just so I know by just glancing at this piece, okay, there's gonna be mortise somewhere here, somewhere here, and on this side of the board. I did that for everything, and now I can lay everything out to be a little bit more precise and set up the router for my mortises. But before I do, I wanna talk about the placement of these, and I wanna show you a quick diagram. Cabinet A, B, C, and D. That's four cabinets, four corners per cabinet. Each one of these corner pieces, the legs on the bottom, and then the corner posts on top, 
are all the same height and pretty much have the same geometry, just a slight difference. That means that there's going to be four mortises in each leg. There's four legs in each cabinet and there's four of them. 64 mortises total for the main construction here. Things can get a little bit confusing, so to reduce the confusion as much as possible, I tried to size the vast majority of everything to be the same, and I came up with two different dimensions. The mortises on the front of every one of these cases, so the front rail top and bottom, front rail top and bottom, and then the front rail top and bottom, top and bottom, those will have one dimension of mortise going into all of these legs, all those connections. Everything else, so that means all of these side rails, uh, bottom and top, the ones we can't see on the other side over here, and the back, all of those will be the second dimension. So the reason why I had to break this up into two is because there's going to be floating panels on the side, back, and side, and then the front right here, the front right here, and of course these doors. Uh, there's not going to be a floating panel in the case construction here. So one of the, the reason that that makes a difference is if I have a tenon on the end of this board going into a mortise on the end of this leg and that tenon extends all the way to the bottom side of this rail, then that means the mortise has to extend all the way down there as well. And if I'm just slightly inaccurate with my mortise, then once this, once this door is opened, I might be able to look in from the side and actually see the bottom of that mortise if it's chiseled just a, just a little bit incorrectly. I want to completely avoid that possibility altogether by notching out the bottom side of this tenon. So there's going to be a little notch on all of the bottoms and all of the tops, respectfully, on these uh, mortise and tenons, mortise and tenon joints. Uh, so over here, that doesn't matter because if I extend this tenon into this mortise and have it all the way down to the bottom side of this rail, then it doesn't matter because I'm never going to see the inside of this board because once this is assembled, then we're going to come back and we're going to cut a groove for the panel. So if I am a little bit inaccurate with my mortise on this piece for this rail, it doesn't matter because this panel is going to cover up that mortise. It's obviously not a necessity to have two combination squares for the layout, but if you have access to two, it's going to make things a little bit faster for you. So I have this one set at one quarter of an inch, and on this board, remember I said I just went ahead and made a reference line to designate that somewhere along in here is a mortise. This tells me the mortise will be here closer towards this face. So I can say that the mortise will stop one quarter of an inch from the top. So there's my stop line. And then I can use the other one to say that my mortise will, will uh, end over here at this line. So this is the start and stop point. And really all I need for all of my mortises is to locate the start and stop line because the distance from here I don't need to draw this side of the mortise and this side of the mortise because all of that's going to be controlled by the diameter of the router bit and the distance from the fence to the router bit on the plunge router. To reduce confusion we're going to go ahead and lay out all of the mortises with a pencil before we make the first cut. I just put my twin screw pipe clamp vise back onto my assembly table and this will really aid in holding the uh, legs in place while we cut the mortises. This is a very inexpensive way to get a very nice uh, vice option for any type of work table. I have this on my main channel on, on YouTube and I'll post a link for all of you guys to check this out if you're interested in making one of these vices. To make all the mortises, I'm using a plunge router as well as an edge guide attachment. Now, just like the twin screw vise that I previously showed you, I do have a free video on my main channel showing you how to make this universal edge guide attachment. It's a really handy attachment. It works on any plunge router, so I recommend making one of these if you don't already have an edge guide available for your router. Now, before we get into actually routing everything out, I want to talk briefly about the router bit itself. Both of these are quarter inch diameter router bits, at their cutting edge anyway, and they'll both produce quarter inch wide slots really well. One will be a lot more versatile than the other one though, and that is this spiral bit. So this two flute straight cutting router bit is good if you need to make a slot starting from the end of your material and then working your way into the material. 
it's not that good if you need to plunge down in the middle and then make your slot. And the reason being is there is no center to this router bit on, on its end over here. It's kind of hollow. So picture a quarter inch diameter drill bit that has no center point. It's not going to be too efficient. This one, on the other hand, is a two flute spiral upcut router bit. And the upcut means it pulls the waste up, which is good for plunging applications like making mortises. But because it's spiral design, the cutting edge extends towards the center of the router bit. And that allows it to efficiently plunge into your workpiece and then cut a slot. So for these mortises, this is the style router bit we're going to use. In this orientation, the router is upside down and I have the bit just barely in the collet. And that's because I want to reference off of the shank of this bit. So this is the fence that I will be using to reference off of every uh, outside face for all of the mortises. And I need exactly one quarter of an inch gap in between the router bit and the fence. And the easiest way to do that is to just use a quarter inch drill bit, slide the fence in place, and then tighten down the fence. So now this guarantees all of my mortises will be this exact one quarter of an inch from the outside face of all of my reference faces on all of the mortises. This universal edge guide has two faces, the front face and the back face. And which one you use to, to do the main referencing off of your material determines which direction you need to push the router from your left to your right or from your right to your left. So in my case, I'm using the front face on the router uh, because if you look down on top of the router, the router bit will spin in a clockwise direction. So if it's going clockwise, then on my right hand side, it cuts from the back closest to me. So as it's cutting from over here to over here, as I push this way, it's also going to want to, uh, the cutting action will actually grab the wood just a little bit and the natural motion of the router will want to counteract that and push the router that way. So for that reason, it's going to basically keep the fence tight up against the workpiece. If I was to use the same front face on this edge guide, but instead of going left to right, go from my right to my left, then what that means is it's going to, as it spins around, it cuts from on my left side closer to me to further away, and therefore it will counteract that and push the fence away from the face. I don't want to be fighting the router at all. I want the router to work with me as much as possible. So I will be cutting from my left to my right because the face, uh, the fence on my edge guide is the front one. To establish the depth of the mortise, we're going to use this turret stop. Now from manufacturer to manufacturer, it might be slightly different, but the process is pretty much the same to set this up. So in order to set up the plunge depth, let's first bottom out the router onto the work surface. Now we can bottom out this plunging rod to the bottom location on this turret stop all the way down. From there, we're going to set this as zero. So up here on my scale, I'll move this down to zero. And then we can determine our plunge depth. We want to go down one inch. So I'm going to raise the whole rod to the scale at one inch. That means there's one inch from the bottom of this rod to the bottom turret stop and I'll lock that in place really quick. Now when I start making my cuts, I know that I can go to the top turret stop here and plunge down just a little bit and work my way all the way through these turret stops as much as I need in each pass. And once I plunge all the way down to the bottom, I know that I will go a full one inch below the surface of the material. Setting the back fence on this jig is optional. You really only need one fence, but now that I have it, I'm just gonna go ahead and use it. We've got 64 mortises to cut, and that means we're gonna be here for just a little while. And anytime you have a lot of repetition, you're gonna be in a spot for quite a while. Make that spot as comfortable and ergonomic as possible. So for me, I don't wanna be standing up and bending over trying to get my eyes close to see what's going on and uh, that's, that's just not gonna be fun. So I'm using a shop stool that allows me to easily go from one side to the other very easily, and it also puts my eyes closer to the action so I can actually see what's going on. Now there's two things that we need to maintain uh, contact with throughout the entire process. Uh, number one, the front face needs to be pushed up against the front of your material at all times. If not, your mortise is going to be, well, it's not gonna be in a straight line. 
Uh, the second thing is the bottom side of this edge guide attachment needs to maintain contact with the top side of our workpiece. And that's, and that's an obvious, but I bring that up because sometimes these jigs can get just a little bit tippy, especially if your workpiece isn't that wide. So you can, if you want, uh, clamp in some extra material to provide extra material support. Uh, for me, I'm confident with keeping this nice and firmly planted, um, but always keep that in mind that you can always add some extra stuff. The, the only area for concern for me is at the very beginning of my mortise because the uh, first half of the jig over here, or the um, edge guide, is just hanging off into space. So if I do let go, it's going to tip. Now, you obviously aren't supposed to let go of a router regardless of what's going on, uh, but just keep that in mind that the base can get a little bit tippy if you are not familiar with doing this process and if you're not um, keeping an eye on exactly where the, the edge guide is in relation to your workpiece. To make the mortise, I'll make a full depth plunge at both the start and stop edge of the mortise and then nibble away the rest of the material in multiple passes. And don't try and take out too much. You'll quickly realize that the router just won't allow it. With all the mortises done, we're focusing our attention back onto the other side of that joint, which is the tenons. And this is all of our tenon stock that we uh, milled for a second time down to its final thickness. Now we can joint one edge at the jointer and then rip all of our pieces to their final width. Before cutting all of our pieces to their final length, we're doing a final layout to determine the best color and the best layout for each individual board. So in this orientation, we have the upper cabinet doors. These are all four of the styles. And then these two boards right here are all four of the rails. We still have to cut these and get the pieces out of them as well. But you can get a good idea by just laying out all your pieces, how everything's gonna look. And we've mixed and matched and rotated and moved everything around to where this is the best color match uh, from all the, the different angles that we will be looking at these doors. So to make sure we don't get anything mixed up, I've labeled every single one of the joints. So one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, uh, five five and so on so that once we cut These down the middle and get everything down to our final size. We'll know exactly which pieces go to which Joint and the appropriate face uh, that will be seen when it's all said and done We're going to repeat this process for all of the lower cabinets We went ahead and laid out all of our pieces in the uh, proximate orientation and tried to mix and match to get the best grain selection as well as the color flow and for all of my parts, I label them the way that it works best for me. Label your parts the best way for you. But for me, uh, I determined which cabinet it's going to go into and then the length of that final board as far as its final length. So this board says C11. This means it's cabinet C and it's 11 inches in its total length. That way, once I have all of my parts cut out, uh, I know the approximate location and then I can just flip it around and make sure I get the best face when I go to do the assembly. But now that we have all of our parts laid out like this, we can go ahead and cut them all to their final length. There's many different ways to cut tenons. You can obviously use a handsaw. You could use a bandsaw to cut all of your tenons. You can use a router to cut all your tenons. For me, I personally prefer to use a dado stack and a table saw. So that's the method that we're gonna go with. So let me bring the camera in closer and show you my exact setup. For the setup, I have a three quarter inch dado stack installed. And this is set to the dado stack's max width, but it is not as wide as I need it to be. I need a full one inch length tenon. So in this case, I'll have to make uh, one and two passes to get the full one inch length that I need. That's no problem. Uh, beyond that, I have my miter gauge with a sacrificial fence installed and then a sacrificial block in line with the dado stack installed behind the sacrificial fence. And what this does is twofold. 
Number one, it acts as a dust shroud. So as I push this through, the blade is fully enclosed inside of this block and therefore all of the dust that is being generated is going to be pushed down into the table where it belongs. Number two, it's a little bit of a safety measure because if the blade is fully encased into this piece of wood, I can't accidentally bump into it. We're obviously supposed to stay away from the blade and keep our hands away, uh, but this will guarantee that nothing can actually touch it as it's making its cut. A general rule for tenons is that the tenon thickness should be one third the thickness of your material. So I sized this purposefully at three quarters of an inch thick, which means the tenon should be one quarter of an inch thick. So if it's one quarter of an inch and it is dead center of a three quarter inch piece of material, then it should be one quarter of an inch shoulder, one quarter tenon, and another one quarter of an inch for this other shoulder back here. Now, if we come back to this leg piece, remember our mortises we cut? We cut them at one quarter of an inch in width, and they were also one quarter of an inch from this outside edge. So if I raise the blade to get this absolutely perfect, and it may take several times, I made several test pieces here and finally got the blade height established so that uh, it is perfectly centered and it is one quarter of an inch in width. And if I put it into this mortise as a test, this outside edge should be nice and flush, which it is. And we can finesse this with hand planes later, uh, but we want this to be really close right now. Now, a couple things to note here. Uh, if I push this all the way in, that tells me a couple things. Number one, if there's no gap anywhere, then my uh, shoulders are nice and square. That means that this angle from this miter gauge to the fence is indeed 90 degrees. Also, if I don't have a uh, uniform gap, like there's no parallel gap right there, that also means that I'm, the tenon is not bottoming out into the mortise, which means the lengths are set appropriately. So I have everything fitting the way it should. I made several test pieces to verify that. Now and only now, I can run all of my pieces and batch out all of the tenons. One final thought in regards to sizing the thickness of your tenon. I want all of my tenons to, uh, in this case, it's, it's holding itself up against gravity. Now this isn't a really big piece. You don't want something too heavy. Like if I go this direction, it's not gonna hold itself up against gravity. It's, this board's too heavy. But in this case, we have a friction fit. It's holding itself up against gravity, but it's light enough to where I can insert it easily with one hand. That's, in my opinion, the perfect fit because modern glues, modern PVA glues, like uh, type on one, two, and three, they have water in the glue. Well, what happens when you put water on wood? It expands. And if this is so tight right off the saw so that you have to use a mallet to put it together, well, what's gonna happen when you put the glue on it? Well, it's gonna expand, especially if you put glue on both the mortise and the tenon, it's gonna expand so much that it's you're really gonna have a difficult time putting this together and you could probably end up damaging your material. So the perfect fit is something that will hold itself up against gravity, but is easily inserted and removed. Just a little bit of friction is all we want. And then that way we can just let the glue do all the work. We have all of the tenons cut on all of our rail material and to reduce confusion, we laid everything out in its appropriate orientation. Now, if you notice, everything is stacked too high. So the lower ring on each one of these is the lower rails for each one of the cabinets and same with the uppers. So we have cabinet A, which is the top left, cabinet B, which is the top right, cabinet C, which is the lower left, cabinet D, which is the lower right. And then also every single one of these tenons needs to have a notch cut on one side or another shoulder. And it is set, uh, the dimensions are the exact same as the dimensions for the main part of the tenon. So the setup on the table saw is exactly the same. Now we do not include the fronts in this particular cut. So the, these fronts don't get cut. Those fronts don't get cut. The other three sides of each one of these cabinets on the top of the top rail, we get that notch cut on both sides. And then on the bottom of the bottom rail, we get that notch cut on both sides. Like I said, it's the same, the exact same setup with the table saw, so we're gonna go ahead and get that cut.
The last thing we need to address before we do our first dry assembly is the fact that we have a square tenon and a round mortise. So you have two options, either square off the mortise or round over the tenon. It's much easier to round off the tenon and you don't have to be perfectly round. All I'm going to do here is pare down through the end grain with the chisel and be careful not to take too large of chunks because sometimes you will get a little bit of drift like in this case where it's trying to take way more than what's actually necessary grain is not cooperating with me on this one. Yeah, in this case the grain is going this way so all I'm going to do is break off chunks if I come down with it. So I'm going to pair off on an angle. Now these don't have to be pretty. All we're doing is trying to make them fit. This side should be a little bit more cooperative. And then at the shoulder, we can just pop off these little slivers. This is cabinet C in a dry assembly. We have all of our cabinets, all four of them, in a dry assembly minus the center style on the lower cabinet sides. And I held off on this because this is going to be in a tongue and groove system. There's going to be a groove all the way around here as well as on both sides of the center style and then a tongue top and bottom that will fit into the other grooves here. And then of course panels inside the rest of it. So I held off on cutting this because I need the groove established in order for me to establish the final length of this piece and as well as to size the, the uh, tongue. So how do we cut the groove? There's several different ways, but there's two methods that initially come to my mind. And that is if we were to just clamp these two pieces together, making sure the front face remains flat, then we can put a slot cutting bit into a router table and run this over the router table so that the bearing reference is on this, this inside face. And we can cut a quarter inch wide groove all the way around. We can do the exact same thing with just a regular handheld router if we clamp everything and make sure that this face remains flush all the way around and just approach it from that method. And that's what I was going to do. However, the bearing that I have on this slot cutting router bit will result in a 3 8 of an inch deep groove. And that's just a little bit deeper than what I want. I want a quarter inch wide and quarter inch deep groove. So we're going to pass on this and instead we're going to take each piece over to the router table individually and use a spiral upcut bit to make a quarter inch wide slot that is one quarter of an inch deep. Here at the router table I have a quarter inch spiral upcut router bit installed and I have it positioned so that it is exactly one quarter of an inch away from the fence and I'm using a drill bit to confirm this. Now I also have the height set at one quarter of an inch and what that does is it establishes a groove that is one quarter of an inch away from the fence and one quarter of an inch wide and one quarter of an inch deep. Actually just a tiny bit more than one quarter of an inch deep. Now I also have these removable fences positioned in such a way that these two reference lines here represent the start and stop point of the router bit. So if I do need to make plunges, uh, plunge cuts, I know that the router bit starts cutting exactly right here at this line. Same with the exit. If I put this over here and line it up with the back side of the router bit, you can see that it exits right there. That's useful if I need to start somewhere over here and plunge down. I won't be able to visually see the router bit, but I can visually see where it is cutting due to these reference lines up here. And a couple of these cuts will be plunge cuts. Now for all of our pieces, we labeled them so that in this case, this board is C17, belongs to cabinet C, it is 17 inches in length. And we wrote all of the notations here on the exterior face. And that's important because due to the fact that our rails and styles are not the exact same thickness as the legs, in order for this groove to line up, we need to have one reference plane that is uh, consistent on all of our pieces and that is the outside face. The outside face of the rails and styles will line up with the outside face of the legs. If that is also the case then we need to put the outside face up against the fence at all times. Now for these cuts as you can see I'll, I'll be cutting into the tenon and I don't want to do that. I want to leave as much tenon material as I possibly can because that's just more surface area for glue. Technically speaking, you can cut through all of this tenon, but like I said, I want to leave as much as possible for glue. So I'm going to plunge right at the beginning of this tenon right here 
and then complete my cut. And on the exit side, I'll do the exact opposite. I'll make sure that the router bit comes through into the tenon completely, and then I can lift the piece off, therefore leaving as much tenon as possible. We have all the grooves cut for the panels and this is a dry assembly of cabinet D. I made sure to put this together so that everything is nice and square and the tops are nice and flush. Now this is the right side of cabinet D and it gets a center style like so. That means we need to cut a tongue on the end of this board that has the grooves already cut in it. Now when I cut the grooves, uh, I tried to make sure that this was perfectly centered but I did it in one pass with the router bit. So if I'm a little bit off, the way to center it is to flip the board around and make another pass, but that will widen the groove. Because I wanted to stay with one quarter of an inch, I just eyeballed center and I didn't do a tremendously awesome job because I can see that I'm visually a little bit larger on this side than this side. That just means we're gonna have two different setups to cut this side of the tongue and to cut this right side of the tongue. That will determine the thickness of the tongue. Now I need to determine the length of the tongue. Now whatever I do on one side, I need to do on the other side. So the easiest way to do that is to simply push this up against the inside face up there on the front and measure this overhang right here. Whatever this distance is, I'll divide that by two and set that as my distance from the left side of the blade to the fence. And that will remove half of that distance on each end, which should result in a perfect fit. The distance from the top of the rail to the bottom of the style is dead on at a half of an inch, so I'm still accurate to my SketchUp model. So I'll set the fence to remove one quarter of an inch. Because my dado stack is set wider than the amount of material that I want to remove, uh, it's e much easier to add a sacrificial fence rather than to take a bunch of the pieces off. So for this case, I have a sacrificial fence clamped to my table saw fence, and then I positioned it to what I think is the appropriate width of cut. I've also raised the blade to, I th to what I think is the appropriate depth, and I ran a test piece. Now this test piece I can use to determine both the width and depth, and in my case the width is spot on, I really like this, right at one quarter of an inch, and I also have the depth of cut right here. So if I spin this around, and if I use the piece we're going to cut as a reference right there, I know I want to remove material from this bottom side, so if I put that material into the depth of cut, and if this surface and then the top side of this face in here are aligned, then I know my depth of cut is absolutely perfect for this side of the tongue. With everything dialed in for the first half of the tongue, I'll go ahead and cut both ends of the board. And after moving the fence twice, we've arrived at the perfect fit. So now that this is dialed in, I'm going to go ahead and make these cuts on all of my style pieces, and then we'll repeat the process for the top part of the tongue. The only difference for the other side is I need to remove just a tiny bit more material, so I'm going to raise the blade by just a little bit, make a test cut, and make sure everything is at the appropriate depth before I cut all of my pieces. The final thing to check is to make sure that the tongue is not too long. We cut our boards to the final length before the joinery, so this tongue might be a little bit too long and may bottom out in the groove. So with another board already cut, we can do a little assembly here and see that there's a tiny, tiny gap at the bottom of the tongue. That means there's enough room for glue squeeze out all of our Faces are nice and flush, so this board is indeed not too long. The doors for the upper cabinets are next, and they're going to be made with just regular tongue and groove joinery, all at the table saw. Now, the reason I didn't use the table saw for all of the tongue and groove joinery down at the bottom is because I didn't want the table saw blade to go all the way through the bottom of the leg, which it would have to do. That means I would have to patch a small piece of groove right here that is going to be exposed in the bottom of the legs where there is no joinery. 
it's not the end of the world if you do have to patch something like that you can do it and you can probably get a good color match if you pull from the same stock but uh, I didn't want to have that patch at all so to eliminate that we used the router table but like I said, every bit of the doors is going to be made at the table saw. Tongue and groove joinery on the table saw is incredibly easy to do. And I have a video on my website showing you step-by-step -step how to make tongue and groove doors uh, on my table saw with a regular table saw blade. The only disadvantage of using a regular table saw blade is you won't get a flat bottom groove because the vast majority of them have alternating angled teeth. Now, if you have a table saw blade that has flat grind teeth, then that'll work just fine. Uh, well, that'll result in a flat bottom groove. This one will work just fine as well. But what I've done is I've taken my dado stack and I've reduced it down to just the outside blades and that will result in a quarter inch wide flat bottom groove. Now, just because it's quarter of an inch and I'm working with three quarter inch stock doesn't mean all I have to do is just try and line it up with center. There's one more thing you have to do. First, line the blade up as centered as possible onto the material and then once you pass your material through, flip it end for end, regardless of how much material the second pass will take, and make another pass. That means if I am 1 64th of an inch away from being perfectly centered, that 1 64th of an inch will be removed on the second pass, and the resulting groove will be absolutely perfect and center. All of the door joinery is complete and the doors turned out really well. We're pleased with the way that these doors look. And of course, all of the base joinery is complete. So now we need to put something in all of these grooves. We're gonna focus our attention on all of the panels and we should be able to get every single one of our panels out of one eight quarter board. This is the board that we're going to use to get all of our panels out of. And it's kind of hard to show an entire board in one shot. So basically this is an eight quarter board. It's got some curl, some, some beautiful figure in it. We won't know for sure how much until we really dig into it. Uh, but the bottom side in this orientation, the bottom side is a little bit more flat sawn, a little bit more cathedral look to it. And the top side has a little bit more... Uh, straight grain appearance to the grain. Now that means we're not going to get a perfect match along its entire width for a single panel. Luckily we have a lot of situations where we can play off of symmetry. So whatever we have in the right door up on top we can flip and put in the other door and kind of get a symmetrical pattern even though individually they may not look symmetrical uh, throughout the entire width of an individual panel. And then also on the bottom, on the bottom cabinet on the sides, we have a center uh, style that's going to divide those two panels. So even if it's just kind of out there as far as the grain goes individually, we, sh we can still book match and have two symmetrical panels, somewhat symmetrical anyway. And speaking of book matching, this is a full two inches thick and all of our panels only need to be one quarter of an inch thick. So what we're going to do is cut this into several different lengths uh, based upon the total length of our panels. And then we can joint two faces at the jointer, a wide face and a short face. And then at that point we will be ready to go at the bandsaw to resaw a bunch of the panels. I have my bandsaw set up with my resaw fence and this is just a very simple homemade solution that slips over the stock fence on the saw. Now the goal here is to get a panel that is just a little bit more than one quarter of an inch. So I set my distance both on top and bottom. Make sure you check the distance uh, from the blade to the fence on the bottom as well as the top to make sure you have your table angle properly set but I have the distance set to be about 5 sixteenths of an inch so we can resaw re all of our pieces and then plane them down to an absolute perfect fit. Each one of our eight quarter boards yielded five panels and now we can go ahead and mill all of these down to their final thickness at the planer. The left and right side of each of the lower cabinets is going to have two book matched panels and we went ahead and made some diagonal lines on our boards before we sliced out these panels. That way we can put them back in sequential order and we can open them up and see book matched panels. So some of these are going to look great. Some of them aren't. That's just because we're going to be cutting through some of the grain. This flat side area, we're slicing kind of in the grain. This 
quarter sawn area will look more symmetrical. So on every one of these, this uh, the outside here will be kind of symmetrical. It's just the inside that's going to vary because we are slicing through the grain. So we want to take the time here and open up each one of these pairs and see which ones are acceptable and which ones are not acceptable because all we need is four book matched pairs. Now this, that's somewhat symmetrical on this line, on this piece of grain here, but then we have this extra one uh, that's all by itself on the left side. So something like this, I would probably say no. Go back to this first one here, and I would probably be more inclined to say yes. We're gonna go through all of our pieces, all of our panels, and make sure we have at least four that are nice in the book matched orientation. We've determined the appropriate placement for every single one of our panels and really take the extra time here to you know, do a once around, twice around, uh, just really look at all of the panels and make sure that you have the appropriate orientation for every single one of them. So now that we have everything in place, we know we're not short on any panels. We know everything should, should look appropriate when it's all said and done. Uh, we are left over with, or we've got five panels left over, which is good because this is going to be some material that we can pull from for the drawer bottoms. Now I understand that not all boards are created equally and you may not have the same amount of yield. You may not even have the same size boards as we have, but keep on to, or keep a hold of all of your extra material because odds are you may end up using it down the road. Now that the location for all of the panels is established, we can cut them to their final width. And to do so, we're using the table saw. We're gonna start with the upper cabinet doors because they are the most narrow in width and work our way around the upper cabinets. Then we can go to the lower cabinets. The most important part of arches is consistency, and to help with that, we are making a plywood template to mark out all of our pieces. I used three quarter inch plywood for this, but ideally one quarter of an inch material should have been used. And for the template, I bent a piece of wood around three nails to establish an arc. Wood will almost always bend inconsistently when used in situations like this, so to give me a left and a right option for the template, I left the right side as is, and then I bent the left side just a little bit more to give a different look. After making a short and long template, we roughed them out at the bandsaw and then trimmed them down to the line with a spoke shave. Because we're using three quarter inch thick material for our template, we need to really make sure that our shaped face remains 90 degrees to the, the uh, parallel faces here of the, of the plywood. Uh, that's more important for wider stock than thinner stock. So if you're using quarter inch, eighth of an inch template material, you probably won't have to do this, but just really make sure you are nice and square if you are using thicker stock. That's important because if we do end up liking this half of the arch more so than the other half, and we use this half uh, in symmetry by flipping the template over to mark our material, then this side needs to be nice and parallel, or this edge rather, needs to be nice and parallel with this edge. After comparing each side of both templates, we decided to only use the modified left side of each one of the templates. This, this just means that when we mark the material, we have to mark half and then flip the template over for the other half. The process for cutting the final material is the same as roughing everything out at the bandsaw and then using a spoke shave, card scraper, or sandpaper to get down to the pencil line. As far as using a template, you could you could actually just you know get one of the final pieces to its final size and then use it as a pattern with a pattern bit on the router table to get all the other pieces to match 100% and make them identical that way. 
but I wanted to show that you can still get good consistent results without template routing. Next up is the interior corner rabbits and all four cabinets will have either drawers or shelves inside. The easiest way to accommodate both the drawer runners and the sawtooth shelf hangers is a simple rabbit and that can be cut on the inside corners. Before doing the final assembly on the cabinets, we decided to complete the work surface panel and top shelf panel so that we would be prepared to do all of our glue ups and assembly at the same time. After milling to final thickness, we used a few number 10 biscuits to help maintain alignment during glue up. Right about here is where we realized the change in direction for this project. So from here on out, we set the base cabinets aside for later use and are going to repurpose the top cabinets into something else. The project change included more mortise and tenon joinery for the inside of the cabinets to attach the connecting rails. Just like before, we used a plunge router with an edge guide for these. The front rail is coming from this board, and on this side over here you can see we've got some defects. So we're not going to cut from that side, we're going to cut from this side. But if we were to just go off this already established edge, all of our grain is just really sloping in one direction. And that kind of looks goofy. So to solve all that, we established a new edge that is parallel with the grain. And now we can use this edge to get our rail out of, and it should be nice and straight across its length. With the material selected for the rails, we repeated the milling process once again. The front top rail is exposed, so we took the time to get a good looking piece for it. But because the back top and bottom rails will not be seen, we used some material that we had that didn't quite have a good color match. Areas that won't be seen like this are a good way to use up some of the less than perfect stock. All three connecting rails get a tenon cut on each end and to do so we used the same process as before but because we only had to cut six tenons instead of 64, we cut them with just the regular table saw blade instead of the dado stack. To reduce confusion as well as tool setup time, we sized all of the mortise and tenon joints to be the same. Just to recap the mortise and tenons here, we've got a round mortise and a square tenon. So you have two options. Number one, well, three options actually. Uh, square the mortise is option one, round over the tenons is option two, or just take the radius here, in this case is one eighth of an inch, and cut this shoulder one eighth of an inch further in, and that way uh, you don't have to do much paring or chisel work or anything. So this is the, this is the front top mortise and tenon, or front top rail, I should say, and I think I had that backwards, yeah. So that's the front top one. The back bottom rail is completely identical. Everything is 100% identical to it. And then the back top rail is not. The joint is identical. This mortise and tenon joint is the same size, but it's offset to one side on a wider board. The reason being is I need this extra material over here to cut a 45 degree angle to establish a French cleat to hang the entire cabinet when it's all said and done. We're getting really close to being able to assemble this thing for the final time, uh, but before we do, we need to make sure all of the little details are taken care of, and one that really sticks out is the tabletop hold-down clip grooves. So we're going to attach the top and bottom panels with these little hold-down clips. Let me bring you in a little bit closer and show you how these work. This little guy is a tabletop hold-down clip, and there's several different styles and names and all of that good stuff. I've always called them tabletop hold-down clips. I buy them in bulk on Amazon. But basically what this allows you to do is attach a solid wood panel, which in this case the workbench, to a rail uh, and still allow expansion and contraction due to wood movement. So we can screw through this into the solid panels that will be on the top and bottom of the case and have this side go into a slot. And you want that slot to be just a little bit more so than this this height right here. So if I hold this flat, whatever height that is, increase that. So I think that's about half of an inch. That allows the screw to maintain downward pressure. So we do have the tabletop being uh, secured firmly to the rest of the cabinet. But this side goes into that groove. And what that allows is as the tabletop has seasonal expansion and contraction, it can slide in and out of the groove while still being held in place as it should. To cut the grooves, I have my table saw fence set at one half of an inch away from the blade and the depth of the cut to be one quarter of an inch. 
This is the front rail and it needs an arch cut on it on the bottom side so that the center point is one inch away from the edge. And I've just positioned a couple clamps over here so I can bend something around them to get that perfect arch. Now as far as what to bend around it, uh, I'm not using a piece of wood and the reason being is, is wood is very rarely consistent. In this case, if I bend it, I'm bending this piece and I don't know if you can see it, but on my left, let me look at the monitor so I can see. On my left, it's bending quite a bit more than on my right. It's just not a consistent, consistent bend. So uh, there's too much variation with wood. I always like to find something else that is a little bit more consistent. In this case, a big uh, drywall square. And this will bend around with no problems. And the resulting, the resulting arch I can trace and it's way more consistent than that piece of wood was. The same process of using the bandsaw to rough out the arc and then a spoke shave to get to the cut line is used for the front arch rail. The front arch turned out really good and when we put the top on here, it, it just really flows. Uh, it connects the two together rather than just a regular straight rail. So we're dry fitting that, that's good. The bottom back rail is dry fit, that's good. The back top rail needs to be cut at 45 degrees on the bottom side for a French cleat. Those two mating 45 degree angles create a French cleat. So if you're not familiar with what a French cleat system is, uh, pretend that this is attached to the wall. So this is the wall. Actually, I'll just, I'll just rotate the camera on the computer. So this is the wall and this board is attached to the wall. This board is attached to the cabinet. So instead of wrestling around the cabinet trying to get it in position and hold it in place while you secure it to the wall, all you have to do is hold the smaller, much more manageable piece up against the wall and secure it to the wall studs. And then you simply take the cabinet, slide it over the top, and set it into place. French cleats are just fantastic for hanging cabinets or anything like this. 45 degree angles are also really sharp and delicate, so to prevent these from, from breaking off, I'm just gonna hit them with a block plane real quick, just to take off that sharp edge. The interior shelves will be adjustable, and in the interest of trying something I haven't tried before, I chose to go with a sawtooth shelf bracket system. I needed eight of these hangers for the two cabinets, so to cut down on the number of cuts as well as increase the accuracy from one piece to the next, it makes sense to mill a larger block into the profile needed and then rip the eight individual brackets out of that block. I made the first vertical cut in the board without the sacrificial fence on my miter gauge, and since then I've installed it, and basically this is nothing more than just a simple box joint jig with an alternate spacing. So this spline represents the exact same thickness as the blade and it is offset so that the left side of the spline is one inch away from the left side of the blade. Now I can make all of my cuts uh, to evenly space all the verticals. So the first one that's already cut I can set it down on top of the spline and that positions me left and right. I'll make a cut, pick the board up, and then put the new kerf onto the spline, make a cut, put the new kerf onto the spline, and so on and so on. And I think there is 12 or 13 of these cuts um, on the sawtooth hangers. I tilted the blade to 45 degrees for the other cut, and as far as the left and right placement, it's just a matter of removing the screws holding the sacrificial fence to my miter gauge, and then just eyeballing the placement left and right. Now, something that really helped me out is I took a scrap block and I laid it against the carbide of the, the saw blade so that it references nice and flush. And then I can push my workpiece up into it or actually slide this block back to my workpiece and really extend these teeth into the workpiece so I can see exactly where it's cutting. And then I can dial it in left and right to, to really verify its location. Because the last setup created another kerf cut into the sacrificial fence, when the 45 degree angle is cut into the fence, a small triangle of supporting material is cut out on the fence. I had to glue this piece back into place before making these angled cuts so that there would be material in the fence to push the waste piece forward and past the blade and not get trapped between the blade and the rest of the material. I have the board sitting so that the last kerf that I have remaining is straddling the key on the fence for my miter gauge. And as you can tell, 
I can't make that last angled cut in this orientation. I need to shift over once more, but I don't have anything to reference my key against, so instead I'm going to rely on measurements here. I know that my initial spacing for the vertical cuts was exactly one inch. So what I can do is use this stop block up against my material with the material once again on top of this key in this last kerf, slide my fence up against that block and that gives me a distance on my scale and I can move over by exactly one inch and that is exactly one inch right there. So now I can remove this fence and use this with my mutter gauge and this stop lock to make that last cut. Now that the profile is established, eight one half of an inch thick brackets can be ripped out of the block and we actually cut 10 of them just in case one broke. It's a good idea to cut extra with stuff like this, but luckily we didn't need any of the extras. Next up, we cut the top and bottom panels to their final size and set up for the coves on the table saw. Sean recorded this video for his channel, but it's, it's a very basic setup. Basically, set the blade height to match the desired rise of the cove and angle the sacrificial fence so that it intersects the center of the blade and the distance from the fence to the opposite side of the blade at its furthest forward position is equal to the desired run of the cove. Once the angle is determined, we put a pencil line on the table, clamped the fence to the table on the pencil line, and slowly raise the blade with the motor on to take about 1 16th or 1 8th of an inch per pass. After a test block confirmed our setup was good, we ran both the top and bottom panels, and cutting coves on the table saw is a great way to get a custom profile that you may not have a route of it for. The only downside of this is that it produces not so clean of a cut as a router bit will, and it oftentimes requires a lot more sanding and touch-up work. All of the case components are now complete, so we can do the assembly stage. Now before assembly, I want to pre-finish all of the panels. The reason being is if I complete the project and then apply my finish, and the panels shrink, it exposes some of the panel that doesn't have any finish on it. So to prevent that from happening, we're going to pre-finish the panels, do all the glue up of the assembly, and then at a later date, if the panels shrink, well, it just exposes some more material that is already finished. Before we do any of the finishing, though, we want to do a little bit of surface prep. And to do so, I've got sandpaper, a card scraper, and a hand plane. And basically, there's a couple different reasons why you would use each one of these. I always tend to go for the hand plane first because it's the most efficient use of my time. It, it, it removes the most amount of material and I can dial it in to really determine how much material I am removing. It's slicing layers off the top. Next up from that is the card scraper and you're scraping layers off the top. This is a little bit more forgiving. Actually, it's a lot more forgiving if you run into situations where the grain just isn't cooperating, the grain is going in multiple directions, and the hand plane is causing tear out over that multi-direction grain. So then we would switch over to something like this, a card scraper, or a cabinet scraper, which I have right here. A cabinet scraper will do the job just fine as well. And then beyond that, if you just want to make sure that the entire surface is at a uniform texture or a uniform um, well, I guess texture is the right word before finishing, then you would switch over to sandpaper. Also, Mark Spagnuolo, the Wood Whisperer, uh, released a video recently on showing the differences of how a finish actually looks on top of uh, sanded material, scraped material, and hand plane material. And I encourage you guys to check out that video. I'll have a link in the description. But basically, uh, if you slice off the material, if you're using a hand plane, it's a cleaner cut so the finish actually has a little bit more contrast to it rather than sandpaper where you're just basically crushing the fibers and embedding them into the rest of the wood. So if you want a more of a contrasty finish then definitely try your best to get all the finish all the surface prep done with a hand plane. If you want something that's a little bit more even which in this case we want to not exaggerate some of Cherry's traditional blotchiness so we're probably going to do the bulk work with the hand plane and scraper and then switch over to sandpaper to just kind of dull down all of the fibers and hopefully reduce some of the contrast. For a finish, we're using garnet shellac. 
because shellac itself is a very forgiving finish. It burns in as each layer is applied, so you can kind of manipulate the layers below very easily if needed. And the garnet color is commonly used on cherry or other species where a reddish hue of the shellac complements the wood and gives it more of an antique look. After applying one coat to the panels, the same surface prep is needed for all of the interior faces of every component. It's gonna be much easier to remove mill marks on the inside faces before assembly. Finally, the assembly can begin and we broke it up into a few stages. First, the doors and cabinet sides were assembled. Then the sawtooth brackets were added to the inside of the side assemblies. While waiting for glue to dry on all of those, we switched to sanding the coves to remain productive. And we finished that day with the final case glue up. The next day I came back with just a little bit more surface prep on the dartboard side of the cabinets and then glued the connecting rails in place. To make the interior shelves, we used some of the off-cut material from the top and bottom panels. In order to make these sit flush with the shelf supports, but also extend to the walls in either direction, the corners need to be marked and cut out at the bandsaw. It's best to sneak up on the fit in this case. We don't want the shelves to rattle around because we remove too much material, but we want them to be easily adjusted and move freely with no problems when we want them to move. To make the supports, we cut another piece of leftover material to the longest length between the sawtooth brackets, cut a 45 degree bevel on each of the end grain sides, and tested the fit. Once the fit was confirmed, four shelf supports can be ripped out of the piece, just like the brackets themselves. And here's how the system should work. Before mounting the doors, we put the top and bottom in place just to get an idea of how the piece was looking. For the doors, we chose to use some soft closing overlay cup hinges. A spacer block is used to elevate the door to the appropriate height, and from there, a center line for each hinge can be drawn on both the door and the inside of the cabinet. These are seriously the easiest hinges I have ever installed. After verifying the drill press placement, all you need to do is drill an appropriate sized hole on the center line that was just marked, screw the hinge to the door, and then attach the hinge to the cabinet with a screw through the center line on the cabinet. It is seriously just that easy. Then you can turn the adjustment screws as needed to align the door. A 3 quarter inch plywood back panel was sized to go between the cabinets and in front of the back rails, and we covered that with a thin layer of cork. To give the dartboard more visual interest, we're going to offset it from the cork panel and use these LED lights for a backlight. To eliminate the ugly power cord hanging down from the cabinet, we chose to go with a battery powered lighting kit. Now the cool thing about this is that it can be run off of either four AA batteries or any USB power supply. We had to do a little bit of figuring out and this is what we came up with. This is a just a four sided box out of plywood, just glue and brad nails just strong enough and that's all that matters and it's it's sized so that it is this plus this will give us the appropriate spacing off of the back panel which i think this combines to be six and three quarters of an inch so what we need to do is first lay out this dead center on this cork piece where it will be visible where the dartboard will be visible what i mean by that is this piece of blue tape down here represents the bottom edge of this arch and we want to center it vertically from the edge of this blue tape to down here, which I've already made my uh, reference notations here that it is eight inches off the bottom, which puts it perfectly centered. And see eight inches off the bottom. That means it should be eight inches on the top side to that blue tape, which it is. And then I have 10 and a quarter inch to either side will be perfectly centered left and right. This is, oh, I was really close. That's 10 and 3 eighths. So I'll come back to 10 and a quarter and 10 and a quarter. Just want to verify that that is all the way around. 10 and a quarter. 10 and a quarter. All right, so now this is not perfectly centered on this back panel. It's perfectly centered in the vis visible area 
due to this arch. So there's a little bit of a difference there. Now what we want to do is trace around it with a sharp knife to remove the cork that we uh, have in the center here. This is the wire that came with the kit and I've already cut off one end. Uh, the reason being is I need to fish this through a hole into this corner post here. And if I have both ends on there, I'm going to have to cut a or drill a pretty large diameter hole, much larger than what I want anyway. So I figured out that on this side, which is this is the side that connects to the lights, it's just a very simple positive and negative soldered connection. So that's going to be very easy to extend. So what I did is I cut it over here and now I can drill a much smaller diameter hole through this side of the cabinet and that way I can put the USB side inside the cabinet, fish this wire through that very small hole and then it'll go into here where it will connect to the lights. Of course after I reconnect it to this uh, end over here. This is that extension box that we made and as you can see we painted it black. I don't know if you can see uh, actually right there, that's a hole we drilled on an angle to fish the wire through for the lights. And the lights will come out here and then wrap all the way around starting from this side and going in this direction. This side is going to be closest to the dartboard. But this doesn't mount directly to the dartboard. This mounts to another plate that we made. And I've already traced this centered onto this and drilled the appropriate holes on the inside to screw from the bottom side of this plate into this plate. And once that is done, then we can mount the dartboard on the other side of this by drilling right through it into the dartboard. Now that these two pieces are put together, I can put this on the cork side and Sean can secure it from the back side. To make sure the dartboard is attached perfectly center as well as aligned vertically, we used double-sided tape to position it from the outside. Then the platform can be removed and the dartboard can be secured with four screws through the mounting plate. After a final disassembly, everything can get any last minute surface prep and the finish can be applied. We are using the same mix of garnet shellac, applying the first coat with a brush, sanding with a 320 grit sanding sponge after the first coat has dried, and then adding a few more coats with a balled up rag. The last thing to do is add the LED lights, install the dartboard for the last time, and secure the top and bottom panels with the tabletop hold down clips. So as you can see, the dartboard cabinet is done. It turned out quite well, especially considering that this was, I guess you could say a salvage product project. We started with one intention and ended up going a completely different route. And this is the final product. Uh, the lighting behind the dartboard turned out quite well. Again, it was a little bit of an experiment. We didn't really know what to expect. I think we hit a good balance between not being too bright and not being too dark. It's, it's, it's an accent and that's all we want. We want the rest of the piece to be the showcase and the lighting to be an accent. And because we have the dartboard away from the back wall, it's not in a shadow. So we still have the ambient lighting in the room, whatever room it'll live in shining on the front of the dartboard. It's a lot brighter out here too. So it's not, it's going to look a little bit more, have that little glow in the back a little bit more than yeah, what you're yeah. seeing here. Once we get it out of this shop. Yeah. So uh, the couple things we have never done before, but we got them done. It, it, you know, woodworking is, there's nothing in woodworking that you can't do. There's always stuff that you just haven't done yet. And there's a few things on here that was the case for us. Uh, he's never cut coves on the table saw. Mm -hmm. How did you like that process? I think it was, I, I liked it. It was not as intimidating as I thought it was going to be. You know, it turned out to be a fairly simple, you know, job. Yeah, once you get it done yeah. once, then it's like, oh, well, that's no big deal. Yeah. And then uh, for me, I've never done the sawtooth hangers on the inside of the cabinet. Very simple process, but it, it's something that... It, it adds a, a lot of interest to the inside of the cabinet. You could probably get away with a lot less work just using regular shelf pins, but that's interesting. I think it adds a lot of visual interest. I really, really like that touch. Yeah. But anyway, if you want plans for this project, the dartboard uh, cabinet, then be sure to check out my website, jayscustomcreations.com. I'll have links to all the important stuff for this project down below. Be sure to check out Sean's website, stoneandsons.net. He's the one who bought all this 
awesome cherry that we got to work with. Uh, by the way, cherry lumber, fantastic. If you've never worked mm -hmm. with it, really nice. It's it's one of the best uh, one of the best species to actually work with as far as ease of use. Yep. But anyway, that's it for this video. You guys take care, and we'll catch you on the next one. See you. <laughs> See, See ya. ya. <laughs> that's just my sign off. See ya.